Good evening, and welcome to our special Women's History Program, Women's History Month Program, co-sponsored by our Bay Area JCCs and featuring two award-winning media mavens, Nadine Epstein, Editor-in-Chief of Moment Magazine, zooming in from Washington, DC, and Michael Krasny, longtime host of KQED's Forum, zooming in from not too far over the Richmond Bridge. I'm Shana Penn, Executive Director of Toby Philanthropies, which is a devoted funder and advocate of the JCCs, as well as of Moment Magazine and KQED. Before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to briefly recognize the seven JCCs who came together to co-host this event. So thank you, JCC of the East Bay, of San Francisco, of Los Gatos, of Marin, of Palo Alto, Foster City, and Sonoma County. And a special thank you to PJCC's Arts and Culture Director, Kimberly Gordon, who produced this evening's program. Now, onward to introducing our illustrious conversants. Nadine Epstein is an award-winning journalist and author. She's editor-in-chief and CEO of Moment Magazine, which is dedicated to providing readers with informative, timely, and differing perspectives on contemporary Jewish religious, political, and cultural issues. Nadine is also founder and executive director of the Washington DC based Center for Creative Change, co-founder of the Daniel Pearl Investigative Journalism Initiative for Reporters, and founder and editor of Moment Books. And by the way, did you know that one of the founders of Moment Magazine was the Nobel Peace Prize recipient, Elie Wiesel. Now this is Yichus. And if you're not familiar yet with Nadine's previous book titled Elie Wiesel, An Extraordinary Life and Legacy, I strongly recommend it. This evening, we're here to explore Nadine's new anthology inspired by and in concert with another extraordinary personality in our lifetime, the late Supreme Court, Court Justice, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. The new collection of biographical essays is titled, RBG's Brave and Brilliant Women, 33 Jewish Women to Inspire Everyone. Indeed, Nadine believes that greatly expanding the number of women in major leadership roles will make the world a better place for everyone. And this collection of portraits of women from ancient times through to the present day makes her case 33 times over. You'll find a link to order the book in the chat. And speaking of Yichas, how fortunate are we, dear audience, that we can learn about this book and Nadine in a conversation with expert interviewer and Nadine's longtime friend, Michael Krasny. The celebrated host of KQED's forum, Michael, a PhD, has been in broadcast journalism since 1983. He was with ABC in both radio and TV and migrated to public broadcasting in 1993. He's been professor of English at SS State University He's also taught at Stanford, the University of San Francisco, and the University of California, as well as in the Fulbright International Institutes. A veteran interviewer for the nationally broadcast City Arts and Lectures, uh, Michael is the author of a number of books, including Off Mic, a memoir of talk radio and literary life, and Let There Be Laughter, as well as the 24 lecture series in DVD, audio and book, short story masterpieces. Michael's the recipient of many awards and honors, including the S.Y. Agnon Medal for Intellectual Achievement, the Eugene Block Award for Human Rights Journalism, and the James Madison Freedom of Information Award. Now, before we I turn it over, a little housekeeping. Because of the large audience size, we're asking you to remain muted for the program. But please note, we are eagerly accepting your questions through the chat function, and those can be sent to host and co-hosts. And please use the chat to give a shout out. Tell us who you are and where you're from. Thank you so much, and take it away, Michael. And thank you, Shana. Let me welcome everybody. Echo the welcome that you heard from Shana, and tell me 
tell you how delighted I am to be with my friend Nadine Epstein and to be talking about this book of hers. And it's, I think, not only inspirational, but it's also quite educational. Uh, I want to thank her personally for all that I learned from this book. Thank her and, well, Ruth Bader Ginsburg because they wrote the book in collaboration. And I thought we'd maybe begin by talking about that collaboration and that friendship. Uh, a lot of the book had its genesis uh, sitting in uh, the chambers of Justice Chambers office uh, and finding out really how they could narrow this down and whittle this down. And that of course is an obvious question as well. It's an embarrassment of riches when you're thinking of remarkable and extraordinary Jewish women going back to the Bible. There are 33 here, but you know, Madeleine Albright just passed away. There are many who didn't necessarily make the cut who could have been a book of, of a sequel or a number of sequels to be sure. But I thought maybe it would be instructive and important to begin, and not only by welcoming Nadine, and as I said, I'm delighted to be in conversation with her, but also finding out how did this begin? How did you form this relationship, this friendship, and this collaboration with Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg? Well, first of all, hi, everybody, and thank you, Michael, for doing this, and thank you, Shana, and thank you, Kimberly, and everyone there. And I see people of all ages here tonight, which is wonderful. Um, so I discovered, I'm the editor of Moment, and I discovered about 2014 that Justice Ginsburg was a devoted reader of Moment magazine. And she, I interviewed her and we became friends. And she was, um, you know, I did some projects for her, actually I helped her with some projects and I interviewed her a few times. And in 2019, we honored her with our first Human Rights Award and we gave it to her in New York. We're in DC, she lived in DC, but we were in New York and we gave her this incredible, beautiful, it's actually on the cover, well, kind of doesn't actually really look like this, but the collar with the Zedek collar for justice. And she loved it so much. She announced right then and there at our gala that she was gonna wear it the next day, the, the first day of the next term, which was in 2019, which turned out to be her last term. And so she asked me to bring it to her chambers. And I, I did. And of course, going to her chambers was always a treat because she was just so her, her chambers were just so beautiful. They were just filled with art memorabilia and photos. And um, she was she had such an artistic eye. She dressed so artistically and she her just her surroundings were so artistic. So anyways, we were talking about she was talking about the women who sustained her in her life, the Jewish women who sustained her in her life. And she started talking about Henrietta Zold and Emma Lazarus, um, Lillian Wald. And we were, I, then I started telling her about how when I was a kid, I was a really nerdy kid. And I read every single biography in her school library. And about 350 of them, but 340 were about men. So I read 10 about women, Louisa May Alcott and Clara Barton and Molly Pitcher and Amelia Earhart. And so I said something that I say all the time because I'm a writer and I'm an editor and I, I love talking about books. And I said, you know, we should write a book. And Justice Ginsburg just said, yes. She was very blunt. <laughs> she, didn't, she didn't speak with a lot of fuss. She just said, yes. And so there we were suddenly, you know, I was so busy, she was so busy, but there we were on this journey to like writing this book together. Well, it's in many ways an amazing book because you're able to bring these stories out, going, as I said, back to the Bible, going back to the Old Testament. I mean, there are characters from the Old Testament one would expect to see, like Deborah, uh, <laughs> who's a very important figure I know in Judge Justice uh, Ginsburg's life. Uh, as you said, Harriet Zold was, and then Lazarus was. So there were figures that were important to her. But there are kind of a little some surprises here. Um, I mean, particularly in biblical times, you'd expect, for example, uh, Moses' sister and Moses' mother, but not necessarily some of the, shall we say, lesser known characters that you include. Talk about that. Well, the first people that she said after I said, you know, let's do this book. And she said, yes, she goes, and they have to have the women of the Haggadah in the book. And I was like, OK, because I was thinking more modern women. But I said, OK. And she said, have to have Miriam. You have to have Yochaved. Yochaved. You have to have um, um, the midwives. I was like the midwives and you have to have Pharaoh's daughter. And I was like, Pharaoh's daughter, she's not maybe even Jewish. She goes, it doesn't matter if she's Jewish or not. These are the women who 
basically made it possible for Judaism to survive. They're, they're our heroes. So as it turns out, neither of us actually really knew this, but according to Midrash, and I learned this quickly, um, but yeah, Pharaoh's daughter is considered Jewish in Midrash because she married into the Levite tribe and then she left Egypt with the Israelites. But we didn't actually think about that at the time. But these women were so important to her because she had missed them when she was young in, during her family seders. She, was, she wanted them to be in her Haggadahs and they weren't in the Haggadah. So she felt they had to be in this book. Um, she also just started spilling out the names of lots of women. And some of those women, of course, like were alive, like well, the, Gloria Steinem. She really wanted Gloria Steinem to be in the book. But as, it, as the book evolved, it looked like it was really all women of history. And it seemed a little odd to add women who were still alive. And um, so we just, and because of course we didn't know she wouldn't be there in a year's time, you know, there was more time we could always go back and we could do another volume and had women who were up to day. Um, so anyways, that's how it ended up being focused on women of history. But boy, you, I mean, I know at one point you had about 150 women, you got down to 33. That was quite a, uh, <laughs> quite a job in itself. Onerous, I would think in some ways and terribly challenging. Yes. Well, she had so many women that she wanted to do. And so after that first conversation, I went back to my office and I started um, doing some research and I wanted to have like a diverse group of women. So I came up with a long list of women and then I went through the women with her. And then we ended, we, but we had to decide somehow. So we really ended up deciding on the women who mattered most to her in her life, some of whom I had never heard of. And then all those women, by the way, given Justice Ginsburg's druthers, they would have been all lawyers, writers, and um, singers or musicians. And so I, I wanted to add, I added Salome Alexandra, which is this incredible queen, Judea that nobody knows about. But she was such an amazing person and queen, and we should know about her. And, you know, I added Emmy Nether, who was an amazing mathematician. So I added some variety. So what happened is I ended up learning about the women that she thought were really important. And then she ended up learning about some of the women I thought were really important. And then, but we agreed together on every single woman who would be in the book. But yeah, I, have, I have a list of 130 more women that, uh, <laughs> or 123 more women that are sitting there um, that I've never gotten to. Uh, some of uh, those who are involved in this evening's program have probably never heard of, but who have made amazing contributions. And I wanna talk about some of them specifically. But first, um, when we're looking at the lives of these women, um, we're thinking, I, I just did an interview uh, last week about my book on Jewish humor, and uh, the interviewer said, I said something about Ashkenazi and Sephardic, and the interviewer said, I'm sorry, could you explain the difference between those two? Uh, and for those of you in this audience who may be a little bit um, rusty on those terms or not familiar with them, we're talking about Ashkenazi Jews being predominant for the most part, Eastern European, and uh, the Sephardic Jews more Northern Africa, Spain, Morocco, those uh, Jews of, of often darker hues and so forth. Um, you went to, you, you see, you use the word diverse because you really went to some lengths to, to include Sephardic Jews. But now yes. we're getting all this emphasis on Jews of color and Jews not only who are Sephardic, but Jews who have pigment and melanin and uh, who come from different color backgrounds. Um, what about that challenge? I mean, how did that actually work for you or not work? Well, it's a really great question. It's one of the biggest criticisms that the book has received is that there are no, you know, there are no African, no black women in there. There, the, there are women of color in the book. Um, there are women, a variety of views of skin colors in the book. But so this was a real, we were looking at women of history. So first of all, it's already hard enough to find out about women of history because women were very rarely documented by historians. But basically we had to, to really, from the eras that we were looking at, there weren't that many Jews that were, had black skin. Um, so we did look into some women who were Yemenite and women from Africa, but there wasn't enough, and I looked into these, not Justice Ginsburg, but there really wasn't enough documentation about them. So, and it was very hard to like, they were like, it's more like legends. So I was trying to really focus on, hist on history and historical women, but it's, um, you know, I would have loved to, if we do, if we could have done another book and we had a more about 
women of more modern times, then I think there would have been a lot more color diversity than there is. But certainly Doña, you know, Doña Gracia Mendez Nasi was, you know, uh, Hispanic and she was an absolutely amazing woman. What an incredible woman, really a, a visionary. She actually created, she doesn't really get, people just don't know about this, but she really, you know, centuries before Herschel, she created um, a Jewish homeland in Palestine. She cut a deal with the Sultan, uh, the Ottoman Sultan, and, and basically built this whole community for Jews who were fleeing the Inquisition. What an amazing, she, she used her wealth to really help people and help Jews. And, and it was a thriving community until she died and then the Sultan died. So she's in there, um, I'm sure bought you, you know, and it's also, it's really hard to know the skin color of a lot of women from the past as well. There's just simply, there's no, there's no, there's no evidence of that, so. Well, it also must've been difficult because when you get to the 19th century, there are so many women and the 20th century, there are so many women, but you sort of focused on a single selection for the 16th, 17th and 18th centuries for each of those centuries. Well, so again, a lot of these women were the women that Justice Ginsburg really wanted to include. And they were women that had meant something to her. And a lot of them came from the 19th century or the 20th century. So um, I was really the one that was added, you know, Salome Alexandra and Gracias Mendes Nasi and Gluckel of Hamlin. Justice Ginsburg had never heard of Gluckel of Hamlin. Um, she loved Rebecca Gratz. We, and, Ernestine Rose, oh my God, she's such an amazing woman. I didn't know anything about her. She was just this, uh, the daughter of a rabbi, a strict rabbi in Poland, whose father, whose mom dies when she's 16, leaves her a fortune. Her father decides to marry her off and give her fortune to the man he's chosen for her. She's, she goes to court, to civil court, which is completely unheard of, <laughs> in the next town, acts as her own lawyer, wins her freedom and wins her money, gives the money back to her dad, takes enough to leave to go to Berlin, becomes an entrepreneur, ends up in the United States as one of the leaders of the suffragist movement, one of the most renowned fiery speakers of her time. And talk about intersectionality. She was fighting for abolition and women's rights at the same time. So anyways, we both, she was just amazing. Justice Ginsburg adored Fanny Mendelssohn. Fanny Mendelssohn, just she felt Fanny Mendelssohn, Felix Mendelssohn's sister. This is Felix Mendelssohn's sister that most people yes, don't know anything about. Who, who may have been more talented than her brother, but who wasn't allowed to publish her own music or perform in public. Justice Ginsburg felt this was such an injustice that Fanny Mendelssohn just had to be in the book. Emma Lazarus just had to be in the book because, you know, Justice Ginsburg grew up in New York, went to the Statue of Liberty, imbibed the poetry of Emma Lazarus. Lillian Wald, an amazing woman, again, just had to be in the book. Justice Ginsburg adored her. Emmy Nether, I added, because I'm the daughter of a physicist and mathematician, and I felt like we had to have some, and she's, oh, talk about an amazing woman who faced more, she was just, it was impossible for a woman to even study math, let alone to get a PhD in math at her, during her time. And then she, she does it anyways. And then she gets a job offer at the University of Gutting and she gets there and the job has been rescinded and she's only allowed to teach under a man's name, like another professor's name. She can teach his class and she doesn't get paid. So she lives in poverty for most of her career. Is and, she the one um, Einstein called a genius? Yes, yes. And Einstein calls her a genius. And not only does she, so this is incredible gender discrimination, but she faces, you know, discrimination because she's a Jew and then has to, gets out before World, before World War II, and then comes and teaches at Bryn Mawr, where finally she gets respect um, and she's safe. It's just incredible story. Um, Rose Schneiderman was another just amazing, relentless advocate on behalf of working women. Uh, I added Sarah Schneer because I felt like we needed to have an Orthodox woman. And she really brought education and Jewish education to Orthodox women in, 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 in Europe, in East Europe. Justice Ginsburg couldn't have been more in love with any woman besides Henrietta Sold. <laughs> she was always reading a new biography of Henrietta Sold. She was and a woman had, Hadassah. So it turns out I, she was so much more than that. 
she well, was no. an I mean, she saved, really, she saved children really didn't she she saved children from the holocaust but she was a, an amazing intellectual she was you know the head of um, really the jewish publication society which was just getting started having a woman be involved in that was was you know revolutionary she was on all these committees about israel that no other women were on. She went to rabbinical school in New York. She had to promise before, she had to sign before she attended that she would not ask to be ordained as a rabbi. But she was like an amazing student. This is, she's just such an amazing intellectual. So she's the com combination of intellectual and activist, which is just um, very special. So- You've got a lot of firsts here too. The, the first woman rabbi, the first uh, woman congressperson or member of the U.S. Congress from um, San Francisco in San right in San Francisco, yeah. 18 uh, late, late 1800s, uh, and, 1892, I think, graduated UC Berkeley. Plus, you know, yes, uh, local did. Stuff, even local stuff for me as a boy from Cleveland. Uh, because, uh, Judith and Redman, a woman of uh, humor, by the way, not from Akron. She wielded power with humor. See, <laughs> one of my real interests here is how women wield power. And women in this book wield power in so many ways. The women in this book tell the story of the evolution of women rights, women's rights, not just in the Jewish world, but in the, just the world. And um, so how they wield power is always fascinating. And Florence Prague Khan was, you know, a very successful Congresswoman and, um, but known for her, her humor and really liked, really liked by her colleagues and also really accomplished a lot for San Francisco. Yeah, like I said, I learned so much about these amazing women. It was really a whole kind of postgraduate education for me. I didn't know that a woman had won the Nobel Prize in medicine, medicine and physiology, for example. Yes. I didn't know that Gertrude Berg, who I watched as Molly Goldberg as a kid, whose real name was Tilly and had built this media empire. I mean, as a guy that was in the media and remembering that the Goldbergs came back to television years later, nevertheless, she, Gertrude Berg, who started out as, of course, a Yiddish uh, stage actress, had this amazing career. I mean, she was the most, second most popular woman in America next to Eleanor Roosevelt. Who would have thought? Well, first of all, Justice Ginsburg loved Rita Levy Montalcini, who's the one who won the PhD in, 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 in medicine. And she had met her. She had met a few of the women in the book, by the way. Um, the other woman that she met, by the way, and I'm gonna get back to Gertrude Berg in a second, was Muriel Faye Siebert, who's one of my absolute favorite women, but she had met her as well. And there's only one woman in the book that we both met, and that's Muriel Faye Siebert. Um, and that's just because when I was maybe 20 and I was at University of Pennsylvania and I was on a train back from New York, and I was on Amtrak and there was an empty seat next to me and a woman got on the train and sat down and it was Muriel Faye Siebert. <laughs> and, um, she had been in a helicopter crash that day and she had survived, everyone was fine, but she decided she wasn't gonna take the helicopter home. So she took the train home. So she sat next to me and told me the story, like started talking to me and, and she was just amazing. And at the end of the evening, she gave me her little business card and said, call me. But being a you know, self-involved 20 year old, I never called her, but what an amazing experience. But let's talk about Gertrude Berg a second, because Gertrude Berg was one of Before the women. Before you do, Nadine, I just have yeah. to say, um, I had the privilege of meeting two of those women. I interviewed Betty Friedan, who's, a, who's yeah. in the book, leading feminist author of Feminine Mystique. That's a, quite a story in itself. But uh, I also uh, had the opportunity and the privilege of interviewing Nadine Gordimer, another Nobel Prize winner in literature, South African writer of great distinction. I mean, it just seemed to me that this gallery of women, this pantheon of women, uh, had so many inimitable women that, I mean, even have figures like Golda Meir and Anne Frank, uh, it's a very exclusive crowd of 33 women. And it, it really has just the gravitas and the, I use the word that I like to use, kavod uh, or kavod, depending on whether you said the Hebrew or the Yiddish, so much deserved yichas, so much deserved prestige and status to make women proud and to inspire, as you say, people, regardless of gender, regardless of background. By the way, Michael has a, a beautiful essay about Kavod that's at momentmag.com, which you guys could go look at because this is something that he thinks a lot about. But Justice Ginsburg loved um, Gertrude Berg 
because Gertrude Berg was, she listened to Gertrude Berg on the radio when she was coming up. And she knew that Gertrude Berg was supporting her family and was proud of it. And in that era, women who, who worked were looked down upon, their husbands were looked down upon because they couldn't support the family. And she thought that even as a young woman, young kid listening to Gertrude Berg, she thought that was nonsense. And which I'm sure she got from her mom. And um, anyway, so that's, that Gertrude Berg was a big deal. Betty Friedan was a woman that we actually, the one woman we kind of disagreed about in the book. We didn't disagree that she should be in the book, but we disagreed about how important she was. And this was something that I ended up really, I learned a lot in doing the book about Justice Ginsburg. Um, but we, when I did my first draft and Justice Ginsburg I hadn't realized she was going to want to read every single word that I wrote. Um, she disagreed about how I felt. I felt that Betty Friedan was more important than she did. And I think I, she, she crossed out and said, no, she's not as important. She wasn't important to urban women and she wasn't important to women of color. And I, I totally understood that. But for me, growing up in the New Jersey suburbs, my mom was an amazing speaker and leader and had a career and then got married and moved to the suburbs and had four children and was suddenly surrounded by piles of laundry. And um, on the shelf was Betty Friedan's Feminine Mystique. And being that nerdy kid, I read it at age like 12 or 13 and said, this is my mom and this is every single woman I know. <laughs> and so for me, Betty Friedan's book was really meaningful, more meaningful than it was for Justice Ginsburg, who recognized that Betty Friedan was an important figure, but who, of course, Justice Ginsburg grew up in, you know, New York and lived in Boston and lived in Washington, D.C., and was also married to Marty Ginsburg, who was, you know, the prototype of the most wonderful man in the world, uh, who really not only just, you know, begrudgingly supported his wife's career, but was an, an advocate for his wife's career and was delighted to be home cooking as well. So, I mean, there was a lot that I learned in the process of kind of editing the book with Justice Ginsburg. Yeah, her husband continues to have a halo. Uh, and um, let me say something about halos for a moment because she certainly has one and she could have been easily in this top 33. Um, she's an icon and she, you know, has been compared to the likes of Abraham Lincoln and Martin Luther King even in terms of, uh, just the extraordinary differences that she made in terms of especially American culture and American. A bit about her, but there's also, especially now I'm thinking about this in, in the Supreme Court hearings that we're now witnessing um, with Katanji Jackson. Uh, Justice Ginsburg was one, at, once asked how many women should be in the Supreme Court. And I think her answer was nine. Um, all, why not have, in other words, the Supreme Court all women? But I wanted to ask you about this controversy that continues. There are many who feel that she should have retired earlier. And I wondered how you thought, what your thoughts were on that. Um, because she had cancer a number of times and because you know, many people who feel that um, they could have uh, had a better candidate than uh, Amy Conan Barrett, uh, that in other words, she should have really given up her post. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I want to talk about, first of all, that I added a chapter on Justice Ginsburg after the book, she died. And it's a really important chapter that talks about the gender discrimination she, she faced, but also why she's so important, because I think most people don't realize why she's so important. Um, and also, I want to talk about that question about how many women should be on the Supreme Court. It's one of the things that I learned from her. Like there were, there were a couple of things that, and you can ask me this later, but that I learned, but I learned, I once had this conversation with her in her chambers and I said, it would be wonderful if half, we had half women on the Supreme Court. And she said, what are you talking about? No, we should have nine women. We've had nine men for centuries and no one made a fuss. And so no one should make a fuss when there's nine women. And she was absolutely correct. And I realized, you know, my expectations were not just quite, were not high enough. And I, I, I learned something there. So should Justice Ginsburg have, um, have, have left the court earlier? Well, none of us really know and think that we're going to die. And I think Justice Ginsburg had many times uh, battled cancer successfully. And I think that she thought she could do that again. Um, I think that by the time cancer came about anyways, that this last bout of cancer happened, it was just too late. 
Um, I do feel that there was a little bit of sexism that was involved. Like there was an expectation that Justice Ginsburg should step down that of course, now we did the same thing for Justice Breyer, but until that time, you know, generally uh, Supreme Court justices made their own decisions about when they were gonna step down. It wasn't always political. So um, what ha would, would we all like for her not to have passed away at that moment, but she did? Yes, of course. Um, it's very hard in, to judge her in retrospect. Well, talk also, if you would, Nadine, about her conception of being a lady. That was a very important concept that was inculcated and sort of really emphasized to a great degree by her mother, uh, that idea of being a lady and always acting like a lady. So I think there's a misconception about what her mom meant by that. So yes, she was very much, um, she was a very graceful woman. She wrote, she, she was a lady in the sense that I'll show you, you know, whenever you, you went to visit her or you gave her a gift or something, she would send a lovely, lovely thank you note to you. That is very much to me, that's the essence of, you know, being a lady and, and such a lovely, graceful, wonderful thing for all of us to do because it's, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful thing. But I don't think that's the only thing her mom meant by saying that when she, want, she wanted to be a lady. Being a lady meant being independent. It meant not being dependent on men. It meant being able to support yourself. That's what being a lady meant. You know, it wasn't just that, you know, you wore white gloves or you ate daintily or whatever. By the way, Justice Ginsburg ate everything on her plate. <laughs> Um, but so I, I think that that's a misconception to some level. Um, she was also, she didn't, she didn't, um, she wasn't a person who um, argued with you. Um, she wasn't a person who like had fights with people. She, we talk about this in the end of the book, in the, in the call to action. I mean, she's someone who went out of her way to make relationships with people who she disagreed with, to find areas of trust. And if we want to call that being a lady, I think, I think Scalia, I would call that being a wise human being. And, um, and her couldn't have been more different in terms of their ideologies, but they got along famously. They loved to go to the opera together and they were close friends, weren't they? And that's how we have to create change. And that's how we have to transcend. Uh, one of the ways to transcend polarization is to build and maintain friendships and relationships with people who we don't disagree, but we find things that we trust or we like about them because that's, you know, but to completely corner yourself off into a world where everybody is just like you is the wrong way to live. It's, it's, it's not a healthy, it's not healthy for democracy and it's not healthy for us as human beings. So I think in that sense, um, you know, again, she was um, a very civilized person and uh, that might be a better term than ladylike. Well, you have, in, in a sense, the book implicitly and explicitly makes a case for women in, to gain power, to gain positions, to, to realize fully their potential. Uh, I mean, it's all there in the book and also uh, to gain, uh, remember they didn't get the vote until 1920, but also there's ERA and all of the, what that represented. I mean, there's within the book itself, a kind of editorial case that you're making, isn't there? Well, there's definitely an editorial case. So one thing I learned from just a couple, I learned a few things from her, but one of them, you know, I was sitting there in her office one day and I said something like, you know, I like being a journalist because I don't like, I don't need to be out in front of everyone. You know, I can be behind the scenes. And she said, get over it. <laughs> and I was, in my heart, I went, what? And she said, if you don't speak your mind, no one is going to speak it for you. And I, this, those very simple words just sank into my skull. And I went, you know, that's so true. And I had to just force myself, just as Ginsburg could force herself to get out in front of people. So could I. And it's so important. The message of this book is that we need more women in leadership and power, leadership of everything and power of everything, and not just leaders of women's groups, but in, and but it's so incredibly important because women bring something to power. And not only women, there are many men who share some of those same traits, but the traits that women bring to power or women in general bring to power, consensus building, the change in tone, being able to listen, 
to be able to come up with building consensus and in a very practical way, there's just really important for our future as humanity, as human, the human future. So we, it's, we really, really need to bring more women into power. She was well, absolutely right. Of humanity and bringing women into power. Talk about some of the women. I, you know, I was just really impressed with uh, knowing the whole tradition that Jews have of trying to do good deeds and tikkun alam and make a difference and uh, change the world and build a future and also um, particularly do sadaka type of work, charitable type of work. I mean, so many of these women really did kind of change the worlds that they lived in, in in terms of good deeds, in terms of virtue or positive acts and so forth. Talk about yeah. a few of those women, because they're very important to know. Well, absolutely. I mean, first of all, Salome Alexandra was an incredible political leader, but there are women like um, the women like Lillian Wald. I mean, Emma Lazarus, Emma Lazarus is a writer, but who became an activist because she wanted to help immigrants. And a lot of them were the Jewish immigrants who came in from Russia. So she became an activist and a lot of her work, that's how her work became imbued with, you know, about writing about immigrants. Um, Lillian Wald, I mean, Lillian Wald is an amazing woman. She brings the whole concept of public health to New York, to the world. She introduces public health and public nursing um, that poor people are not, are not poor, poor, they don't deserve to be poor. They're not poor. They, 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 if they, they deserve health care, just like everyone else deserves health care. It's not their fault that they are poor. And she, she's revolutionary for her time. Rebecca Gratz is also, Rebecca Gratz is a woman who is bringing, you know, all sorts of like or, orphan societies and educational societies, helping, helping people. And she actually starts all this in Philadelphia. And remember, this is just the time the United States is starting. It's a very exciting time. And the organizations that she starts, some of them are ecumenical, some of them are Jewish, inspire women all over the nation, Jewish and not to start creating organizations like this, orphan societies and schools and um, Sunday schools. So, so she has a huge influence. Um, Henrietta Zold, as we talked about, Rose Schneiderman. Rose Schneiderman comes from nothing. She's like, you know, an immigrant in poverty. And she ends up becoming, work, you know, working with Franklin Delano Roosevelt. To, she's just an amazing woman. Another incredible woman is Bessie Margolin. I was Bessie, just going to ask you about Bessie Marvel. Yeah, she's an orphan, and she 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 ends up going to becoming the first woman to go to she goes graduates at first of her class in Tulane Law School, goes to Yale, can't find a job because of course, as Justice Ginsburg found out afterwards, is nobody wanted to hire a woman. Only the government would hire a woman, so she went to the Tennessee Valley Authority, and then she went to the Department of Labor. She was a pioneer in trying to fight for women's way, equal wages and, 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 and children protect, protections of children. She just did like amazing things. Um, and by the way, she was very poorly paid and had to go to the first, to Frances Perkins, who was another woman, I, if we weren't just doing Jewish women, who I would have loved to have in the book. But Frances Perkins was, of course, the, the cabinet running the labor cabinet, labor, labor department. And um, she wrote a letter to uh, Frances Perkins and then got her raise. She only got her raise because there was a woman on top, by the way. So um, so there are so many women here who who did who, you know, who I had occasion a number of yeah. years ago to interview um, both James Watson and Francis Crick, who were responsible for the double helix. <laughs> and uh, the person who may have been as responsible and in some uh, ways of thinking, maybe even more responsible was Rosalind Franklin, uh, known as the dark lady. Uh, yeah. brilliant uh, this is someone who did not get the recognition she deserved and uh, an extraordinary woman who made an amazing contribution to science. And there are so many of those kind of women who you're bringing into the spotlight so deservedly as they should. Well, Rosalind Franklin, I added her because she makes my heart go pitter patter because she was a woman who faced such gender discrimination throughout her entire career. And the man working around her really betrayed her. <laughs> and, you know, she was doing this work and they secretly shared her work <laughs> with other men who then had this information um, that, you know, so it was just a she her, she her she was treated so unjustly 
So I felt it was really important for her to be in the book. And you mentioned uh, Justice Ginsburg's love of music. Uh, Roberta Peters made the cut, uh, <laughs> one of the opera sopranos who I'm sure was very important in her life because she was such a music aficionado. I had never heard of Roberta Peters. There were a few women that Justice Ginsburg mentioned that are in this book who I'd never heard of, but definitely Roberta Peters was one of them. And, um, but she loved Roberta Peters. She grew up uh, listening to Roberta Peters. Roberta, Roberta Peters was popularized opera. She was on TV all the time. She was in commercials. So I guess she, she really, you know, had an audience beyond the opera world, but Justice Ginsburg, always said that if she had had a voice that she wanted to be, she would have loved to be an opera singer. And, I knew who she um, was, I just didn't know she was Jewish. <laughs> you, what? I said, I knew who Roberta Peters was, but I didn't know she was Jewish. So she was very Jewish actually, yes. She got her start because um, she was already, she was her, I think it was her uncle or her grandfather or somebody worked at Concord or one of the clubs up in the Catskills and had her come sing for one, and he was a waiter, or and had her come sing for one of the 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 vis, you know the guests at the hotel. <laughs> um, so yes, she came up and she spoke Yiddish fluently, and she was very involved in Israel. So she was very she was very Jewish. Such a range of stories here, and such a range of different Jewish backgrounds, and uh, it's a, it's a whole spectrum, and it's it's a remarkable diverse group. Uh, there, there may be some controversial figures here too. I was thinking, for example, Bella Abzug still raises controversy. She's more identifiable with hats perhaps than she was as a fighting Congresswoman, but boy, was she a fighter and a warrior on behalf of, well, again, people who needed her. Well, you remember, so just like, so we didn't really talk about that why Jewish women yet and the justice's Jewish journey because this book was very important part of her Jewish journey. But remember when she was, she was a very dutiful young girl who went to Hebrew school and learned all her lessons and her Torah lessons. And then when she learned all the prayers, and then when she was 16, she wasn't allowed, and her mom died from cancer, she wasn't allowed to say the prayers at the Shiva, participate in the Minyan. And that sent her away from then very traditional patriarchal Judaism. Years later, she comes, she's, she never leaves Judaism. She couldn't be a more Jewish person <laughs> informed by more Jewish values, but she really cares about the women of Judaism. Those become her Judaism. And here we were in the last year of her life. These women meant a lot to her. But the reason I bring this up is because Bella Abzug also as a young woman, her father died and she belonged to her with her. She went with her grandfather all the time to an Orthodox synagogue, and she wasn't also allowed to participate. But Bella Abzug went every day for a year <laughs> to the synagogue and stood outside the group of men and said the prayers anyways, and didn't care what the men thought. And we're talking, what an amazing thing for a young woman to do how we just imagine the guts and the self-esteem she must have had to be able to do this every day for a year. So whatever else Bell Ebbs did later in her life, wearing hats, becoming a fiery advocate for women, being a lawyer, just that story about her really touches me. Let me get to that story uh, to get you to talk about how these stories dovetail in some ways, because that's kind of the Yentl story, but not as uh, bold, perhaps, as uh, Bella Abzug was. Or Lottie Pogrebin wrote a whole book about, you know, wanting to say Kaddish for her father and not being able to, and it changed her whole attitude. Uh, patriarchy seeps into so many of these stories, and, you know, young women not getting the same rights or not having the same abilities as young men because of their gender. Well, that's the whole point of the book. I mean, really, I mean, what was, we? You know, I was thinking about, we were looking at um, the women in this book, this was something I wrote early on. Not only was she a success in her field who saved people, made discoveries, or created positive change in the world, she refused to be defined by the expectations and the limitations of her time. She wasn't just a good and patient wife, a martyr, or a victim. She was a woman whose life and achievements in the face of gender discrimination and other obstacles we can learn from and be inspired by today 
She wasn't as a role model. So every single woman in this book was fighting gender discrimination in some way. Well, I shouldn't say that, you know, I'm, I have to say that, you know, Roberta Peters, probably not in the same way. She, she actually had very supportive parents and she had an opera was, the opera world was more open and she wasn't actually the first Jewish woman to be in opera. Um, but the vast, vast majority of these women, um, that's really what led them to be who they are. They were pushing up against these limitations that were, you know, set by men. And they either went around them or just flew right over them. Um, just, just, just that's what's so amazing about them. And breaking barriers, as you said. Um, in fact, uh, I'll be a little um, homeboy here. I come from Cleveland and Muriel Faye Siebert comes from Cleveland and uh, her story is interesting. How did she become the first woman on the stock exchange? So she faced so much gender discrimination working in finance in New York. She was always getting the worst, case, the, she was always assigned like the worst clients. She never could get ahead. So she decided she wanted to have her own company and then she wanted to join the stock exchange. But the New York Stock Exchange was a men's club. I never really thought about it this way, but it was just all men. She had to ask 10, she wasn't being given anything by the way, she had to buy her way onto the New York Stock Exchange, but she had to ask 10 men before one would agree to nominate her. And then one did, and she became for many years, the only woman on the New York Stock Exchange. And it took her 20 years to be able to um, get a ladies room on the main floor where all the deals were made. So it took her a long, long time. Um, she was also a visionary in the sense that she was already talking about diversity in the workplace and why, how diversity brings is, is better for businesses way before all now it's now we all say this all the time but that she was talking about this you know decades and decades before people were talking about this she also really wanted to bring financial literacy to people this is also and so she set up all these programs about financial literacy this is a woman who uh, really gave back she you know she actually reminds me a bit of you know uh gracia mendes nasi in the way she just gave so much back well, we're getting some questions in the chat and please feel free to add your questions or comments to the chat. Uh, this is from um, uh, Joanna who wants to know, can you tell us about Sarah Scheininger um, who um, she goes on to say, uh, revolutionized modern Orthodox Judaism, especially for women. Well, I thought it was really important to include her because I, a lot of these women in the book were not very religious. And I felt like a woman who was who was in the who's an orthodox woman was really important and again this is a woman who you know had went to elementary school um, wasn't allowed women of that eight girls for just weren't allowed to even study they weren't allowed to have jewish studies um, a lot of them didn't study hebrew she actually had some more than because her they had some tutors and she had some tutoring going on but really when it, after eighth grade, she was finished with school and she became a seamstress and she ends up starting these schools in her sewing studio, <laughs> these, these small classes. And she, it becomes this inc incredible enterprise that ends up including hundreds of thousands of women and a real movement within Orthodox Judaism in Europe. So she had a powerful impact. And, you know, she was a woman who wasn't like she was kind of shy and she was, she grew and evolved as she, you know, as she got out in the world. Um, and so anyways, she was just an amazing woman again. And here's Gina who says, no question. I just want to tell you, my daughter received your book as a bat mitzvah gift. And we have really truly enjoyed reading together. It is made for great conversations. Thank you. You're hearing a lot of that, I think, aren't you? That's really lovely. That's so sweet. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for, it's a very intergenerational book. This was another thing is that it's for, we tried to write it so that it was not written down. It's just ages 10 and up because it's a great conversation starter. And also it's very important to realize that this book, these stories are also for, for boys and for men. They're um, originally, I think the justice was just thinking they would be for women. Um, when we had like a first rough draft 
I sent it to uh, some young people to read, by the way, none of whom actually realized that women did not have the same rights as men today in the, in the constitution or their great grandmas couldn't have credit cards. But the boys, in particular one boy who was about 13 came back to me and said, wow, these are really amazing people. Why is it that um, it's written for girls and not for me? And so I went back to the justice and we changed the language of the book. So it's really written for everyone because he didn't know, he was 13 years old growing up today. He didn't know that he shouldn't think these women were amazing. And he did. So well, I'm looking at the back of your book, Nadine, and the justice is quoted as saying, the world needs more courageous and inspirational people. You can be one of them. Uh, that's, uh, <laughs> that's inspirational and meant to be inspirational, isn't it? But it's for all of us of all ages. All of us can do more. It's not just for, you know, 10 year olds and 11 year olds and 12 year olds and 13 year olds. It's the message for all of us. She's just still idolized she was, by so many. Especially, she was, oh, sorry. She was just, she would just think of her. So here we were, it's the last year of her life. We're working on this project. She's, she's incredibly busy. Um, it was COVID lockdown era. Um, she's, She's saying, you know, she has cancer. She's staving off cancer. Um, she's still working on this book. I mean, this woman just never, she just never stopped. She just never gave up. She, and, and, and I think it's an incredible lesson for all of us, I think. Well, talk about her legacy then. That's what I was just about to ask you and how you see it and how it resonates and meaning is meaningful ways for you. Well, one of the things I think about and I, is that, where are we today? I, I feel like having gender equality enshrined in the constitution is very important for all sorts of reasons, simply because we are a democ democracy. We are one of the leading democracies in the world. And there are so many, and, and without having some kind of an amendment that strengthens, that, that enshrines women's rights in the constitution, there are so many fires that we're constantly putting out. So, I think it's really important for us to have a long-term plan about how to get that into, how to, how to get a, 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 an amendment into the constitution. I know from reading Justice Ginsburg, some of the things that she said, that she didn't actually think that we could get this current ERA passed. She felt like we needed to start again. And I think that we all need to think about how to do that in the most strategic way where we can really, and some of that may be, um, changing some of the language, some of that may be not the language of the amendment, but some of culture, we need to create the cultural change and the legal changes that will make that possible. Because her work, what she did with the 14th Amendment, which was a workaround to get women's rights, gender equity in the United States, it's, it's just a workaround. We still have a long, long way to go. And I think we're forgetting that. And I think that's a really important part of her legacy. We all have to come together to do that. Women and men and all genders have to come together at all ages to create that cultural change. She was a long-term strategic thinker. We have to do the same kind of long-term strategic thinking. I've got some uh, comments in here. I wish we had more time for some of these because some of them are really uh, compelling. Uh, somebody says she has a story about meeting Gertrude Berg on Yom Kippur. In Cleveland, we used to say Yom Kippur, a little bit more of a fish holiday, but at Sherith Israel in 1957, when I was a member of that congregation, not that year, but for many years. And somebody else says, I'm thinking about uh, patriarchal Judaism as a catalyst to launch strong women seeking equality and justice. And that's what Nadine and I indeed were touching on. And as she said, that's at the heart of this book. Uh, someone else writes, the confirmation hearings uh, for Katanji Brown Jackson this week just displayed how women are very much in uh, in the periphery. Uh, now, actually, I somebody posted on Facebook. I thought this was ingenious in, in certain ways. Um, a bunch of, about that particular uh, woman seeking to be the next Supreme Court justice. That she's overqualified, charming, poised, brilliant, and certainly none of the men, uh, many of the men who are questioning her, none of those. Um, and you get a lot of these, I suppose. Somebody says. Why Roberta Peters and not Beverly Sills? Uh, or so I can easily answer that because one of the reasons there are just a number of women in this book that 
were the women who were most important to Justice Ginsburg. Remember, these are women that she thought about her whole life. They inspired her. As she said, they sustained her through difficult times, thinking about them, reading about them, learning about them. So that's why these women, it's such an eclectic group. There are so many other women. And as I mentioned, we had a list of 150. So there's still, you know, 117 women that I never had time to, to write about. Um, it just simply ran out of time. Well, it was nice of you to inscribe my book as Michael, my friend who's brave and brilliant, but I think you deserve those adjectives very much. And uh, it's always delightful to talk to you. Could you say something before we conclude and then I'll turn things over to Shana about um, Moment Magazine and what you have to offer? Well, my, well, I was so busy when I was working on this book because of course I'm the editor in chief of Moment and we're actually on deadline tonight with our new issue, but we're, we have a print magazine and also we're online at momentmag.com and we have a lot of publications that come out of Moment that are digital publications and projects. So go to momentmag.com, subscribe and also see all the different things that we have to offer. We have including incredible um, virtual programming. It's called Moment Live. And once, twice, three times a week, we have incredible programs that are free. And we've done a, a bunch on Ukraine recently. Um, Michael does some of the interviews. Robert Siegel does some of the interviews. I do some of the interviews. Some of my amazing staff does interviews. But really great conversations on art, literature, politics. Um, so you can go to momentmag.com slash Zoominars. I think it's in the chat. And enjoy that free programming. So Moment's really like a community. And it's a community for a very inclusive, open community for, for everyone. And we welcome to, you to it. And Dean, thank you so much. Congratulations on the book, Mazel Tov and Hakavod. And uh, let me turn things over again to Shana Penn. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael and Nadine. And Nadine, what an incredible experience you've had with um, RBG to, to work on this book and to, sh to share these conversations with her and then to share something of those conversations with all of us. Um, I'm, I'm so happy to be able to listen to everything to, um, and to feel RBG with us. Um, and on behalf of the seven JCCs, I want, to, I want to share a collective thank you to both Nadine and Michael, and I hope we can do another uh, program together at some point. Thank you all very much for coming and tell your friends that a recording of this webinar will be on all of the JCC's YouTube channels on Moment and on Toby Philanthropies. Thank you and good evening. Thank you. Thank you.